the huge importation of Africa. The huge importation. Now we're going to talk today a little more about um, how that affected the societies in North and South America and the world. And it wasn't who was being uh, enslaved and imported. It was the different cultures that were called. We'll talk about that. That makes sense? Does that answer your question? Kind of, a little bit. Kind of, all right. Now, how did I do it? <laughs> uh, well, I, well I, I specifically asked about, you know, the whole thing. Yeah, well, that was earlier. That was, yeah, you know. That was before that. Yeah, we're talking about, uh, you know, Cortez and those guys. Yeah, so when they started invading, like, northern Chinese territory, and they couldn't make northern Korea, you know, like southern China, they couldn't make us slaves. They didn't figure that they had everything <clears throat> that the Europeans wanted. Um, however, when the, the conquistadors, if you will, showed up, especially in northern, well, mainly in Central America and southern present-day Mexico, they found unbelievable wealth gold. And I think I talked about it, but the uh, Spanish idea of mercantilism was come in, grab the gold, Flash across, kill everybody who didn't convert, and and split. And there are several problems with that. The main problem being that it's not sustainable. And eventually, it takes uh, 150 years, but eventually that plus a few other bad decisions that were multiplied by bad luck. Uh, and we find Spain and Portugal not even players in the game. They lose their position that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Don't let me get away with answering half of your question. Um, okay, shifting, shifting back. Um, as I said, the uh, the cross that were being instituted in the Americas, um, and it was mainly, uh, there were some indigo and some other stuff in there, but it was mainly sugar. And they were all really labor intensive and they required workers. And this is when the slave trade really starts. Um, and as I said, the vast majority of slaves. Uh, were transported throughout the whole period um, to uh, to the Caribbean and to Brazil. Um, actually, we find, and I'm not sure I mentioned them, uh, we find two predominant, some people even consider them separate races. Uh, one of them is the Mestizo. Which, generally speaking, is, and you know, this gets a little loose around the edges, it's been a lot of generations, but generally speaking, is uh, Native American and uh, Spanish women. And um, the other one is the mulatto. Generally speaking, is mixed African, Portuguese, Spanish. And we'll talk about why these people are uh, so dominant in the South, but we won't find them in the North. Um, actually, today in Brazil, there are 40 separate and named different subcultures, sub races. Mixed, uh, racially mixed groups. One of the things that we definitely see in South America. Hiya, Christy. How you doing? What are you doing here? Well, good for you. We help the library, which is useful. Chris is the sky. Guys, that's Chris. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is. 
graduated. She graduated. Isn't that cool? No. See you, see you later. Um, What's this day when I have to lose, lose my train of thought every five minutes? That's okay. Um, the uh, plantation in North America didn't take long for them to adopt the idea of slavery. And they were so incredibly heavily dependent on slavery that without slavery, their entire society would have collapsed. And indeed, it did. Indeed, it did after the Civil War. Um, but we're going to see an entirely different uh, schema as far as race relationships goes. And it's not due to any other reason than the way that the areas were colonized and the attitudes of the people who colonized. Does that make sense? <laughs> So would it be a would it be a safe assumption to consider Catholicism playing its role in a absolutely slavery too? Because you're about to, you're about the Spaniards come in and took in their Bible says God gave gave man dominion over all living beings, and you know native native people were not considered people. Though, they were considered step for the half ahead of you. You are absolutely on track. Um, one of the things that really makes the difference in North America is, um, we'll talk about this in a minute, the English got into the game late. Um, the French were here long before, and the Spanish were, Spaniards were really the first, the Spanish and the Portuguese. But the English brought their women with them. And so there wasn't near the interracial mixture that there was in the South and in the Caribbean. As North America started to uh, accept the idea of slavery, um, there was a lot more separation. Does that make sense too? We got our own room. That doesn't mean that the master wasn't going after the slave quarters at night. He was, a lot. But uh, we're going to investigate uh, the, the major differences between slavery in the South and slavery in the North. Northern South. What happens is that uh, eventually cotton becomes the major crop in the south of North America. And eventually cotton will become the equivalent of what oil is today on the world market. It is that important. However, as all of this interracial mixing is going on for the south, it's not happening in the north. And what we find is North American slaves are unique in that they have a different skin color. And by their very skin color, they are marked as slaves, even if they're not. This becomes a very strong prejudice. Let's, let's face it, we're still fighting today. We're getting better all the time. And I'm going to tell you, you guys that are in the younger generation, I am so proud of you. We have made so much headway that I have to take some credit for my generation. Um, certainly, it started a long time ago that we were the ones that got pissed. <laughs> and, uh, I think one of the things I'm most proud of in my life, I'll just tell you, is that um, I think you do. It was a win for you, right? But I mean, George, he was just sitting there <laughs> killing people. But I did go to, uh, went down to uh, Amarillo and then we went to Memphis. Nice thing. Um, and then we went to Memphis. 
She still drives me nuts with her stuff. But and, and she was the one that gave me a flag hanging on my wall, a neat little sign that says, Friends are people who know all about who I spoke about. Like, but my point is that, you know, one of the questions I bring up, I got two questions. One of them, how come in the summertime 
you guys find it so much easier to get me off track. <laughs> I think it's the class. I think you people are more involved. I think some are, some other people are more involved. And I'm telling you, it's okay. We'll make it through the material. So if we need a sidetrack, don't worry about it. <laughs> can we? I, I just get there. So can we legislate for an LED? That's all. Can we? Maybe. Maybe. I will go with maybe. And I'm going to go back to the '60s. I'm going to go back to '64 and '65 with the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. And all of a sudden. And I mean, we could go back to 1954 with Brown v. Board, uh, where the schools were ordered to integrate. Actually, we didn't even call it integration yet. We called it desegregation. And for a lot of people, that was just unheard of. And we would jump up to 1957 at the Central High School in Little Rock, and we see what eight black students being admitted to school cost. That bastion of civil rights, Orville Faubus, who was the um, governor of Arkansas at that time, came up with a wonderful solution. He just closed all the schools in the state back. It's ridiculous. They don't reject it. But eventually, people got more and more used to it. And as I said before, I mean, you guys, the younger guys in the younger generation, you take for granted. Once upon a time, and we mandated it by law. You know, is is there a lot of prejudice in Clubo? Yeah, but not near as much as there is in a lot of places. Clubo is pretty common. They're all have prejudice. Hmm. Really scared, yeah, I think what happened, and this is my theory about Clubo, and believe me, I'm a Clubo kid guy. Um. Remember, back in the great one, one of the great industrialization periods in the United States after the Civil War, uh, we had all of these smelters and becoming steel mills and all that in Pueblo, and we had all of these immigrants getting off the boat on the East Coast, and there were people waiting for them saying, "Do you want a job? Get on the train." And the guys that were bringing them out to Pueblo. You know, they need a boat that was from Poland and then another boat that was from Ireland. And we had to learn, our fathers had to learn to get along with each other to make work work. And one of the things I love about Trouble is we managed to keep our cultural identity. Uh, it's blending a lot more than it was when I was a kid. But, uh, but I think on the whole, we get along really well. Because I've been in some places where I've been off all. It's like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> well, and I think another thing about Pueblo is we, we, we can't seem to lose that. This is a good thing. We can't lose that small town mentality, that blue collar attitude and all of that. I think that's good. Yeah. I was going to make a point. I think I think it's a good thing actually, because I happen to be from back east. <laughs> I'm from New York, and I, when I first well, <laughs> well, when I it was weird when I first came here, I noticed like people weren't as rude and obnoxious, and I saw I was kind of homesick. To be honest. But yeah, I was, but uh, but the thing is, is I was kind of homesick because I didn't know how to react to that. I was kind of homesick. I'm like, <laughs> I remember. <laughs> I remember where I was working at, I asked I asked somebody to, like, I came out and I was like, everybody's always so nice here. Be rude to me, so I felt like I was at home. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm serious. No, I'm used to it now, but I think it is. I've always said, oh, he's going to spend a week in Denver. And, um, it's a little different. It's a little on the hill. And one of the things I did every night was I went out and walked around the hill. It was kind of a nice place to walk. And, yeah. Well, everybody on the hill walks. I like that. No, I didn't. I'm capital. Oh. Um, and you walk, you know. But man, oh man, you walk by somebody and go, hi. You know, they go. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Different culture. 
they still kept that same idea and attitude. On the upside, because there had been so much intermarriage going on, we don't see, well, we, we, I mean, you're going to see prejudice if you see human beings, but we don't see nearly as much, and it's not so much race based, it's more culture based. Yeah. What was it? We talked about it on sociology in the class. Yeah. Oh. We, uh, we talked about how the majority of the prejudice, I guess, that goes on, you know, like the man So when a black guy or a Mexican or even a woman, that's what they all. You know, like they put, their, they put their race down, they put their sex down, and that's what they look like. Yeah, I remember back in the early 70s, uh, the station manager of the radio station in Arizona, Peter was out. And that uh, was 73. We got this in from the federal government for the Equal Opportunity Commission. I wanted to know how many minorities and how many women we had on staff. Well, it was small enough where it actually counted. But I, instead of doing that, I sent back a letter and said, according to your directive, member so and so and such and such, I'm not allowed to keep the directives. <laughs> I mean, that's not a straight out thing for um, And certainly in the United States, we've been through not only all of those, but we've also been through Jackie versus California, the reverse discrimination of our city. As I said, in my perfect world, we won't need any laws because there would be some people on. Uh, I had family that traveled to Spain and stuff like that and worked with her here. You know, so the dark skin, dark complexion, brown eyes. Sure. They went to Spain. They weren't welcome. They weren't treated as. Like the Spaniards are all yeah. there with cycles across yeah. the they, they, they weren't treated, you know, we were treated like a. Like a Bad taste in their mouth or something because we're descended. You know, we, we, I got Spanish blood in me. You know, that's where the real name comes from. Or Martinez or Rodriguez. That, that's all Spanish. But when you go to Spain, they've got very dark complexion and brown eyes, and they're not going to be walking there. And that's, that is a cultural thing. Sure is. Sure is. Yeah, you know, I cried too much about it. I found myself fixing my life. Which is exactly the California region. But you know, I try to avoid that. No. Um, but I can tell you a personal story. I consider myself probably one of the least prejudiced guys in the world. I would do it. And it's not because I try that hard, it's because it seems to me that's what I'm doing. Thank you, God. When I lived in Denver, Like I said, everybody walked. And I lived a couple of blocks from the great huge supermarket down on 9th and Colonial. And it was one night about, I don't know, 30, 12 o'clock. I decided I needed something down there. I went walking down there. And I was coming back. And someone was following me. And I got nervous. So I turned, and he turned. And I turned, and he turned. And I turned, and he turned. I started walking faster and faster, and all I saw behind me was a big black man. I got about three blocks from my house after walking a mile and a half. And this guy yelled, he says, hey, what's your hurry? And I turned around and it was Skip, who was my best friend that lived across the street. <laughs> but I didn't see Skip. I saw a great big black guy that was following me. So sad. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> and you know what? You know I learned something about myself. Like that. Skip caught up with me, and we ended up sitting on the porch all night with BS. And I think Skip knew, and I knew. Uh, we've all got it, and I still maintain the the basis for most prejudice is fear. But we all do that. Fear of the unknown, fear of the different. I know. Uh, when I went right across a different culture, that's one of the things I love in I love in Florida. Growing up in Florida, growing up in Florida, so many different cultures. Uh, but to me, it's a it's an advantage. Um, 
And there was a student on campus that I got working with as a tutor. I got to know her really well. And she's from Iraq. And I have been picking her brain and I'm learning more and more and more about the Iraqi culture. I think I got her in one of my classes. Yesterday I referred to the ancient civilization of Sumer, which I've been calling Sumer, Sumer all my life, and she went, Soma. And I said, what? And she said, Soma, it's been out of Soma. Well, since you're from there, you probably know. <laughs> Thank you. I will. <laughs> I know she had to leave for her life. I know that she's busy. And she basically had to leave for her life. She's been over for quite some time. She's quite a gal. She got a conversation. Really enjoyable lady. Um, you know, and, and one of the reasons I love teaching at the community college level is because we are so diverse. And I get to learn so much from so many different cultures. You know, and that's really what it's all about. We talk about history. There he goes on the soapbox. But really, what is it? I mean, is it a bunch of things that happened in the past? No, it's just a bunch of people. Human beings, just like you and me, with all the good stuff and all the bad stuff that goes with it. Does he walk out and fall into the good life on his? Well, it's hard to get along with. There's all these very, very prominent people in the who are better than everybody. Make most of his money growing ham, right? Yeah, I made a lot of his money growing ham. But they were used to go. There's all good stuff, yeah. Um, he had a heck of a relationship with Hans and his wife. They really had a good thing. Well, he was generally well thought of. Jefferson, what a spendthrift. This guy was out spending money. He never had, you know. He, I mean, he died in so much debt that the federal government had to take over Monticello because his, uh, his estate was um, So, I mean, he had some. I, I love the story about Alexander Hamilton. Um, when he was uh, Secretary of the Treasury, uh, they went to him and they said, Al, there's something wrong here. It looks like you've been siphoning money off the books. And he said, no, no, I haven't. But I had to hide these finances some way because I'm using them to take care of my mistress. And the truth is, it happened to God where he was because he married one of the states in life, and it was his wife's connection. And he just said, no, 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 I'm not a thief. I'm just an adulterer. <laughs> You know, I mean, they were all human beings. And, and of course, everybody's favorite, my favorite is Ben Franklin. Have you ever seen Ben Franklin's picture when he's with somebody else? I can think of one where it's not a bunch of women. This guy really liked girls. Man, and when he was over in England, we don't even know how many mistresses he had. Um, he liked to tipple a little bit. And during the uh, no Con or the, uh, the uh, Constitutional Convention, when they, everything they were doing was in secret, they assigned someone to be with him all the time. Because he'd go out to these parties and he'd have a little extra wine. And they'd start talking and go, oh, doctor, can we go outside? I mean, all of this stuff. You know? And if we start thinking of history as against people, it makes a lot more fun. So I had to see it. Okay. This is going to be a great class. I mean, I've already seen it. I can't see anything else. I just want to say that. So, let's talk about a little more about these settler colonies in North America. Um, as I said, the Brits are the predominant people. They get started late, so they don't get the best lands. The best lands are already taken up mainly by the Spaniards. 
in present day Georgia and down in there. That's going to make a difference. Uh, they end up in New England, New York, Pennsylvania. There are some other smatterings there. The Dutch have a, a very small but pretty dominant colony in New York. And the remnants of it are still there. The Germans. Of course, that was before Germany, but the people of German descent. So we ended up in Pennsylvania. Um, we call it the Pennsylvania Dutch. But really, it's a mispronunciation of the word Deutsch, which means German. Um, and as I said, Spain was solidly Catholic and solid anyway. There wasn't a lot of change going on in Spain. But in England, and actually, it really started out mostly from a, a Catholic Protestant. Uh, Argument. Remember, uh, King Henry wanted, he was trying to get his son. He was worried about um, who was going to take the throne when he died. And he wanted his son. He went through six wives trying to get one. He never did. And never figured out that it wasn't them, it was him. That's the guys that he got a wife from with all night. I always find it interesting to note that he sired two daughters, uh, one of them who may well have been one of the greatest monarchs ever, Queen Elizabeth I, and the other one, Queen Mary, who could well have been if she hadn't been lost to her sister and eventually lost her head. Um, and of course, that was a Catholic Protestant argument there. Eventually, this is going to lead to a civil war. And uh, eventually the Protestants will come out as well. Another thing that we have to remember is going on is England is the first one to jump on the Industrial Revolution bandwagon. And in that day and age, Industrial Revolution in England meant textiles. And of course, textiles are cotton. That's why cotton is so young. It's a major uh, raw material coming out of the new world. As we see the Civil War breaking out in England, um, we see the breakdown of feudalism. That's been gone, going, going, gone for a while. And we see the loss of power by the crown. And power flowing to Parliament. But the thing is, it's not a very nice place to live right now. With all the turmoil going on and everything else. So a lot of people want to get out of England, and the place that looks good is North America. <clears throat> so, well, political turmoil, social turmoil. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the real pollution doesn't get here in another year. But, but it's just, you know, it's. it's why are people leaving Syria and places like that today? It's the political turmoil. It's a dangerous place to live. That plus the fact that all of this stuff centers around religious conflict makes some of the different sects want to get out too. Now what we'll see in a minute is these guys did not come over to give religious freedom. They didn't come over to get it. So, one of the things we see is a lot more voluntary immigration to North America than we see. I mean, you know, if you're, uh, oh yeah, well, I got, I got sent to the Caribbean. I got <laughs> sent by the king. Over here, people are coming over in droves because they think it's going to be a better life. A better, uh, a better deal for them, more chances, or what we call today upward mobility. A lot of these people come over as indentured servants. Come over here and sign yourself pretty much over to slavery for usually seven years, 
And at the end of seven years, you get your freedom, and you probably get maybe a stipend, and you get a little chunk of land. Is that, where, you, hmm? is that where the American dream comes from? No, nah, the American dream really starts developing in the Gilded Age, in the late 1800s. Um, but, you know, I guess you could find bases there. From yeah, I mean, you know, land of opportunity and all that, rah, rah, rah. Land of Milton. Mm -hmm. Wasn't there a lot of very, like what they ingested sugar to it? So I thought there's a lot of uh, reneging on their deal. The truth is, no, it wasn't so much that. The truth is that um, a lot of indentured servants didn't live. Their services. They were that poorly treated. Mm -hmm. um, but what's going to happen? Uh, England does not go through this turmoil for a long time, and after things settle down in England, it's not going to look that attractive anymore. And so, all of a sudden, we have a severe shortage of indentured servants. That's from the true matter. Now, that also coincides with the tremendous rise in the uh, but that's really how it all ties together. Um, by 1776, when we uh, declared our independence from England, somewhere around 90% of the population of North America was European. Somewhere around. England was mostly Protestant, uh, and the Protestants didn't have a tendency to proselytize nearly as much as the Catholics did. They came over, and uh, but not all. We have a tendency to think that the first English settlements in North America, we attribute that to we love them as the, the, the pilgrims. They're really the, the separatists. But there were a lot of these guys that were also um, in for the money. The first formal English settlement in North America was at Roto. Not only did it not work out very well, but we still don't work out. They dropped a a bunch of people off, and they came back three years later, and there wasn't anybody left. No sign of them. They found a block of wood that had one of the local tribes' name carved on it, and that was it. There were a number of theories. Um, thanks to DNA, it appears as though what happened was that they were just not ready to face the wilderness. And that local tribe took them in. And as I said, DNA evidence pretty much confirms that. We take, but anyway, that was Roanoke. Another one in the classic example, and you're talking about people that get a bad rap, are the people at Jamestown. Now, let's go back to England and see what's happening. The revolutions are over. Uh, we 